Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the Gallery of Modern Art. My name is Ruben Kean. I'm the curator of contemporary Asian art here at the gallery. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of this land and paying my respects to elders past, present and future. I'm delighted to be joined here today uh, by two very special people who I am, have had the pleasure of collaborating with on uh, the exhibition Time of Others, which has just opened um, up on level three here at the gallery. Uh, they are uh, from the outside, or actually from my, from my left first, uh, Che Kyung Fa from the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art Tokyo, and Hashimoto Azusa, um, who's curator at the National um, Museum of Art in Osaka. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the very recent presence in Brisbane of Joyce To, uh, who's been here representing the Singapore um, Art Museum, uh, has stewarded the exhibition um, for us and has had to fly back to uh, Singapore last night. Um, so, uh, but do please join me in welcoming our guests. Uh, this is going to be quite a, a free-ranging conversation. I do have a loose structure in mind, but um, I will um, emphasize that it is loose. Uh, but we'd like to talk a little bit about the background of the exhibition and the way that it's evolved between uh, several venues. Um, it's been an interesting project in that, to some degree, its form has reflected its content. Um, the exhibition is one that uh, looks at the uh, intersections of uh, various different contexts as they coexist um, within a historical framework, um, uh, looking at the relationship of those encounters to the contemporary world, the world in which we find ourselves, and attempting to picture, uh, perhaps, a world uh, that could be a little more understanding. Uh, the um, when I say that the form has mimicked that content, it has really evolved um, across venues. This hasn't been a strictly structured exhibition. It's one that, that's responded to different contexts, so not just uh, different ways of displaying the work or explaining it to people, but actually different combinations of artists and works. Uh, so there have been 25 artists that have involved uh, in the project thus far. There are 19 whose works are on show here in the gallery, uh, and indeed artists have been represented by different works at different times as well. Uh, we're going to have a slideshow rolling in the background, uh, which is going to include uh, a good number of those works, which we hope to be able to speak to later on. Um, I've also organized the slideshow show. It shows some of the variances um, between the display at different venues. Um, and you can use that to compare to uh, the exhibition upstairs. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't yet been able to photograph um, the exhibition in its entirety. I thought I'd start with the signage. Um, because uh, <laughs> that is really the first thing a lot of people see when they walk into an exhibition. Um, in the spirit of chronology, uh, I'd like to um, invite uh, Kyungfa to maybe start uh, by saying a few words about the inception of the exhibition. Kyungfa was really the driving force uh, in getting this project up off the ground and um, corralling a fairly unwieldy group of curators into something resembling a curatorium. Uh, Kyungfa, what were your motivations uh, in thinking about um, this project? Mm. Um, it was right after I joined the museum. Uh, I joined the museum in April 2013. Um, and I wanted, there are a few things in my mind. Uh, firstly, I wanted to uh, initiate this uh, curatorial uh, collaboration among uh, institutions in Asia which are uh, lacking uh, in uh, the practice of uh, public museums in, J in Japan. And so um, that's, f that's one thing I wanted to really sort of get going. Um, and also uh, I've been uh, working with uh, various contemporary artists in Asia, Asian region and that's something that I wanted to sort of uh, do in a museum show where uh, the last uh, exhibition uh, focused on uh, Southeast Asian art was 1997. So there was this uh, almost like 20 years gap uh, in between. So I wanted to show how the practices of, of younger generation of Asian contemporary artists has evolved 
um, which actually does create a lot of um, interesting relationship uh, in terms of issues and, 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 and mediums, uh, aesthetic languages, with uh, younger generation of artists in Japan. Mm. And also, um, I was looking, I mean, the show had to be sort of respond to uh, the general social and, and political atmosphere in Japan, where um, there was a lot of uh, hate speech issues coming up, and the issue of nationalism, and um, uh, Asia becoming a greater uh, economic partner, whereas uh, in, you know, in Japanese society, there's a lot of discri discrimination against, uh, against uh, Asian people. Uh, who are mostly immigrants, uh, illegal immigrants also. Um, so I wanted to sort of respond to that, um, how we can look at um, differences uh, as something that are constructed uh, within a society and how we can actually uh, review that. Uh, that also helps us understand uh, self, uh, contemporary self. Mm. Um, so, I, I remember writing to Riven an um, uh, email saying, uh, what do you think <laughs> <laughs> of, of uh, trying to do it, doing this? And he said, uh, yeah, let's, let's try. So that was, um, I think, it was as early as May 2013, uh, around, yeah, around that time. Yeah. yeah. And so, we wrote a, a text together and proposed it to each museum. So that's how ended up. Um, how that's how it started. Um, another thing I wanted to uh, uh, do through this collaboration was, um, in order to look at uh, practices of contemporary Asian art, um, we I wanted this multiple perspective. I mean curatorial perspectives mm. to be in one show, mm. um, not, you know, it, it, I thought it shouldn't be a curator's sort of um, dictation on uh, the current practices of contemporary Asian art. Mm. So um, that's why I needed uh, uh, colleagues who are, uh, who have been engaged in, in this uh, uh, the practices of this region, and um, you know, Ruben is a perfect um, partner to do it, and also uh, Michelle and Azusa, uh, they have been looking at you know, um, and working with artists from the region. So I thought this is a perfect fr platform to build. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, one of the distinctive features, I guess, of the curatorium was that. Um, there was a requirement that we all worked at uh, museums, at collecting institutions as yeah. well. Yeah, um, yeah, that's for, um, I wanted this, uh, you know, uh, collection exchange also, um, and also really to build up this rela institutional relationship. Hmm. Um, so that's, and also, um, I mean, realistically in, in Asian, a uh, lot of Southeast Asian country, there are a few um, museums that are sort of capable of doing this, you know, organizing this kind of inter international collaboration. Mm. So that sort of limited um, the, <laughs> the options. Mm. But then, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was interesting. Uh, I guess one of the other um, significant factors was that um, the Japan Foundation came on um, as a, a partner, I guess, or a supporter. Yeah, quite I, yeah. I remember um, uh, talking to Furuchi-san, um, and, and she said, yeah, I mean, if, if we, you, yeah, Japan Foundation would uh, be interested in uh, co-organizing this. Mm. So that was a big factor for, yeah, being able to realize this. I think that was, uh, in, in some ways, one of the things that was quite interesting um, that attracted me, um, apart from the, the, the nature of the dialogue that we were having, was that um, there had been a series of exhibitions in the early 2000s that had been uh, put together or supported by the Japan Foundation uh, that brought together um, professionals from a number of 
um, contexts uh, throughout Asia uh, to work on, on developing projects um, under construction uh, was one uh, which was uh, finally realised at the, um, or culminated at Tokyo Opera City Gallery. Uh, and also Have We Met, uh, which was an exhibition of four uh, quite young curators um, from uh, Japan, India, Thailand and Indonesia uh, that was at the Japan Foundation Forum. Um, uh, Japan Foundation uh, policy shifted, or the emphasis within the Japan Foundation um, shifted uh, for a time after that towards um, putting together ex or, or sponsoring uh, exhibitions of Japanese artists in other parts of Asia. Um, but I'd been, those exhibitions uh, I, which I had seen uh, and had been very influential for me as a curator in thinking about um, how uh, different contexts within Asia could be brought together in an exhibition form um, really uh, made this project attractive to me. I think we're all kind of part of a generation that, um, yes. that experienced those exhibitions and was influenced by them. Yes. Yeah. As I say, you, you were nodding because I think you were, saw those exhibitions as well. Yeah, and um, unfortunately I couldn't see the under construction show. But um, personally, um, Japan Foundation gave me some opportunity to join in curatorial collaboration between same generation curators. So I curated other two, uh, two curators from Philippines and Australia, uh, which I uh, curated a show at Perth in Australia. Mm. So that kind of experience kind of uh, feed me. Mm. <laughs> and I got a kind of experience and it was one of the big motivation to join in this project. Uh, you had an interesting um, exhibition previous to, uh, to working on this one as well, which was um, Kazana of the oh, uh, yes. air hole. Um, yeah. <laughs> would you be able to talk a little bit about that one? Because I think it, was a, it, it advanced some fascinating propositions about um, rethinking the ways that we might frame these kind of exhibitions. Mm. Yeah, Casa Ana Air Hall is an exhibition which I curated in 2011 and I invited um, around 10 artists from Southeast Asia and East Asia and it was kind of a thematic show, it was not a how say, um, research based show but uh, I really wanted to uh, put some things together from the, the eldest artist was uh, the artist collective The Play. They are located in Osaka since 1960. And the youngest artist is Contacto Gonzo. They are uh, very active now since 2000. And kind of their, how to say, spirit is same. Mm -hmm. um, although they're the time gap mm -hmm. since like 15 years, they have kind of a DIY spirit mm -hmm. and they feel very free to, how to say, um, deconstruct the existing um, art theory or the theme. So yeah, I invited some those kind of artists from Korea, um, Vietnam, like Dean Kule. Mm. Yeah, so yeah. Um, the fourth curator involved in the project initially was Michelle Ho, uh, who was working at the Singapore Art Museum at the time uh, and uh, was uh, responsible for their um, collection of Thai art, contemporary Thai art. Um, Michelle um, uh, has since moved on to work at uh, uh, NTU, I think, in, uh, in Singapore, um, but uh, and it, uh, the project was then sort of taken on by Joyce To. Um, but when we'd settled on an initial group of four people, we sort of sat down uh, and started... We, had, we were able to have a few physical meetings. Um, we were actually just trying to remember how many we had um, between different cities and in different combinations of people. Um, often these things were done very tactically. If somebody was in town for something, then we could um, all, all group up there and, uh, uh, and sit down and have a conversation. Um, and then the process was one of making uh, a really a long list of artists that we felt mm. uh, fitted in with the thing. Yeah, we had a long one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. There was a, an interesting theoretical and historical dimension though um, in our initial discussions because we were talking about um, historical ideas of Pan-Asianism, um, particularly as that evolved around 
the late 19th century and early 20th century um, as part of the anti-colonial movement. Mm. Um, but uh, we decided not to pursue those in too much depth. No, I mean, it's, um, it's really uh, uh, anachronistic uh, mm. to talk about, or, or yeah, to talk about how united or how same we are mm. um, in a time when, uh, for example, ASEAN is now binding the entire, um, you know, uh, not entire, but associated Asian country, um, and which is actually creating this region, you know, new sense of regionalism. Um, but I've, we actually thought that it's actually more important to look at disparity and contradictions which are existing underneath this, um, you know, unity. Mm. Um, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, look, we were looking at uh, people like Rabindranath Tagore, uh, like the late Qing reformists, uh, Sun Yat-sen, um, particularly Okakura Tenshin, um, and uh, the somewhat um, problematic slogan uh, that he advanced that uh, Asia is one, uh, this idea of a unity, um, that uh, China and India were really joined by the Himalayas and it was a single continuous culture. Mm. Um, but there were so a number of really problematic assumptions built into that uh, that we felt obviously no longer represented uh, even contemporary attitudes at, um, at a trans-Asian uh, collaboration, mm. really. Yeah. 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 Um, the... Uh, one of the other things, Kyungfa, that um, uh, that we had uh, spoken about was the question of representation, mm. um, and this came uh, down to thinking about cultural diversity or otherness, where um, a work of art simply um, represented another subject, um, so basically as an object uh, for the viewer to look at, uh, rather than uh, giving them their own. Um, any sense of having their own subjectivity. Yeah. And that became something of a framework for looking at work. Yeah, very important one. Yeah. Did you yeah. want to speak more about that aspect of the show? Mm. I mean, uh, in, the, in the work, for example. I, as, a frame, as, a, as, a, as a framework. As a guideline for selecting artists, really, because mm. that's what it came down to. Mm. Um, we were quite conscious of selecting artists or artwork, which um, artists... Um, uses as a, a platform to rather explore or examine mm. uh, fixed subjectivity or identity or uh, this uh, discourse of history uh, or national history. Um, for example, Saleh's work, um, mm. Saleh Hussein's work, you, which you see in the gallery, um, he used, uh, he's a painter, but he's used uh, the painting as a way to reach out uh, history that are um, no longer be able to really know in the entire form. Um, because he is looking at the, the particular history which is uh, oppressed uh, to be articulated during the, the uh, Saharto regime. Um, he looked at various archival, archival materials. Uh, which he re managed to retrieve, um, and he realized that there are actually lots of uh, pockets which he can't really go into, uh, or lots of uh, history or narrative that he can't he can't know at this moment. So that is uh, sort of reflected onto how he composed the painting. There are a lot of white uh, margins in the um, in each canvases each canvas and all this, you know, uh, this uh, uh, little canvas coming together, which seems that they're telling something, but it's actually impossible to decipher what it really is. Um, so I thought this kind of practices are quite new uh, compared to the practices of, of back in the 90s, for example, mm. where artists are sort of, you know, uh, telling the stories of their social problems or political problems, so they become like a delegator of the, their society in their international art field. Um, so th this change, um, I really wanted to show it to the Japanese audience, mm. um, because I think, um, especially because of the uh, 
our museum um, not having, you know, not being able to show contemporary art, uh, contemporary art from Asia, uh, there's this huge shift as to how artists practice uh, in the region and, um, yeah, am I? No, and I think it's really interesting and actually those um, shifts in practice were the things that we wanted to look at. Mm. I mean, it's been interesting. There, there are artists from a couple of generations. There are some perhaps uh, uh, weirdly anachronistic works, uh, photographs of Wong Khan um, during yeah. the, um, uh, that were taken during the Vietnam War or the, um, uh, the Wong Kawara works. Mm. Um, but um, these perhaps were kind of added for a certain emphasis. Um, Whereas we had noticed certain shifts in the way that younger artists were dealing with questions um, uh, around um, the construction of identity and of yeah. um, the ways in which history can be accessed. So even those forms of research-based practice that um, we've become very familiar with and uh, in some ways have become a kind of a cliche of contemporary exhibition making mm -hmm. have actually changed. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Like yeah, I really something. agree with Kyung Fa san on that point. And maybe in, in 1990s, there were some um, uh, artworks which really conveyed some message, like political, you know, um, message. But uh, like in this exhibition, like maybe we can think about the Miyagi Futoshi work. Mm. He really uh, um, res did research on the Okinawa situation, but uh, really mix of the fiction in the real story mm. and the, the expression is in a way very romantic so that really <laughs> impressed me that um, you know that's really um, provocative in a way but gave us another um, how say impression you know the yeah as artwork it's really beautiful actually that's yeah. a good point and i think this um mode of uh what I would like um, very quickly call um, maybe documentary fiction mm -hmm. um, is something that it's it's looked at by fewer um, artists in the exhibition. Um, uh, Ho Tsun Yen and uh, his uh, works on uh, well his ponderings really of Lai Tech, um, this uh, figure from the um, history of the Malayan independence movement, um, who uh, was such a shady character that his 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 character can't really be known. Um, and the uh, Ruang Rupa project, which uh, creates the story of this uh, 1970s Indonesian band who has this completely unlikely influence on the Brisbane punk scene during the Bjelke Peterson era. Um, and uh, Mamoru's um, very beautiful uh, sound piece, mm. um, which recounts the geological survey undertaken by B.S. Lyman in uh, uh, 1874 in Hokkaido. Um, there seems to be uh, an insertion of a certain imagination, um, maybe to compensate for a certain unknowability, yeah. but also maybe for certain poetic qualities. Mm. Mm. And also, also to resist this um, power that history, you know, this narrative of history or discourse of history uh, gets politicized uh, in a, you know, uh, national, you know, nationalism or a certain academic, um, uh, yeah, academic schools and so on, yeah. Um, Azusa, um, you were um, responsible for organizing the work in and the arrangement of the show in the second venue in, the, in yep. Osaka. Um, so it was really uh, the first rearrangement or the reconfiguring of a show that, that Kyungfa had organized in um, Tokyo. Yeah. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Because you had, um, first of all, a dramatically different space, um, uh, but also, mm. and importantly, more space than the rest of us to play with. Exactly, yeah. Well, in terms of that, maybe I had two agenda for Osaka venue. One is audience is really different from Tokyo. Could um, you talk a little bit about that difference? Yeah, I will. Um, maybe uh, in Osaka, we have less experience of uh, seeing contemporary art exhibition show, especially like this kind of, you know, Asian contemporary art. 
and um, yeah, so I don't want it to give some impression of this exhibition, like really kind of educational exhibition, because there are many informations unfamiliar to our audience, like the history of Malaysia or Singapore or Aboriginal or that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so I try to put some another, how to say, moment of my exhibition is like the image, using the imagination, stretching the imagination is another keyword for my uh, layout of the Osaka exhibition. And as Ruben mentioned, uh, my place is the kind of biggest venue, like 1,400 square meters. So I decided to add two artists for Osaka. And of course, him and John, who were not included in Osaka, uh, in Tokyo. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, um, I might uh, quickly flip through to uh, some images of those artists because um, there are, uh, as I mentioned, six artists whose works um, have not been shown here at GOMA. And I do think that they're just as integral to the project. Mm. Uh, Kato Tsubasa? Yeah, this is Kato Tsubasa. He, uh, now he is based in the States, but a Japanese young artist. And uh, he, this is the work. The title is They Do Not Understand Each Other. So he realized this work at a, how say, an inhabitant island in the Tsushima, so Tsushima Strait between Japan and Korea. Without, uh, well, the artist doesn't speak Korea, and the collaborator, the Korean guy, doesn't speak Japanese. But the, he, they did this collaboration without translator. So the title is They Do Not Understand Each Other. So in this work, as you see, like uh, this is composed of the video and the photo just behind this wall. Um, yeah, the Korean guy carried Kato-san on his shoulder. And uh, while Kato-san hammered a panel um, with a hammer, the kind of, how say, the placard with a QR code, mm. And the code is linked into uh, Google Maps. So if you capture the code, that you can see the Google Maps on the site where they did this collaboration. So um, this kind of, um, how to say, a discommunication situation mm. seems very sad, you know, generally. But they look very fun. Yeah. <laughs> they really enjoy this kind of, um, misunderstanding communication. So it was, how to say, kind of like hope and each, um, the Kato-san have to take care, uh, consider about um, the Korean guy mm. to, how to say, not injured, not get injured because uh, otherwise they fall down. Yeah. So yeah, it's really, um, I say the misunderstanding, um, this communication situation, but really kind of positive way. Mm. So Playful yeah, too. yeah. Um, another one was uh, the terrific Korean artist uh, Kim Bon. Yes. Um, could you go to the we have other? The, uh, so the art of transformation. Art of transformation. Yeah. This is a. Yeah. This is a book. You can see there is a, his artwork. So maybe we can say that uh, Kim Baum's um, subject here is becoming something other. So um, there is a book written in four um, sorry languages. Sorry. So that's fine. So and for example, um, those four languages they are saying that how to become a ladder if you want to be a ladder. So, but there is nothing like, how to say, a magic word in the book, mm -hmm. but there, um, the book is about how to pretend or how to act like ladder. So it's directly 
you have to imagine that to become not yourself, like something other, like in this case, this is ladder, but uh, otherwise like rock or air conditioner or mm. something not human. Mm. So it's really, um, how to say, caricaturistic situation. Yeah. yeah, but it's also interesting because it immediately poses limitation of, you know, us becoming something else. Mm. Yeah. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and the other work, very beautiful, a ship that was taught there was no sea. <laughs> yeah, this is composed of the video and the model of the sailboat. Mm. And uh, in that video, a uh, lecturer is doing a lecture to the sailboat that, uh, about the earth science, but uh, he is lying about there is no sea in the world. But Except that point, the lecture is completely like scientifically right. Mm. <laughs> so it's really kind of a um, interesting fiction. But uh, that, yeah. So maybe we we will think about that. What? How our? How? How say? How will be educated? Mm. Or the the issue of the identity? Mm. Yeah. Um. Another uh, artist who was in um, the um, Tokyo and uh, Osaka uh, versions of the exhibition uh, was Kiri Dalena. Um, and we, we uh, included her work in um, APT uh, 8, the most recent APT, um, which meant that uh, we're probably uh, not a good idea to include it in this exhibition. Mm -hmm. um, but these images are really extraordinary. You'll have seen, if you saw their last APT, uh, the mon uh, seven of these on a much larger scale. Uh, these are a body of images that she, um, again, in, in trying to access these uh, effaced histories, um, researched uh, through uh, newspaper archives or archives of newspaper images um, of protests before martial law was imposed uh, by Marcos in the Philippines in 1972, um, which spoke to uh, a very different political context, um, both to the one that she had um, grown up in, uh, but also um, to that of today. Um, and this effacement was really uh, initially represented um, by her through the erasure of the slogans. Um, but uh, in doing so, she really enunciated a certain performativity of the images, a certain action, um, that's occurring within the images that speaks across ages um, in a very interesting way. It also um, stimulates the, the imagination of the side of the viewer. Mm. Um, it was interesting how m much attention the, the Japanese audience put into this work um, because there was a, it, when the show was up in, in Tokyo, there was a lot of demonstrations right. against uh, the new security bill that the, the the government was trying to pass, which passed in, in, in July. Um, yeah, so it was interesting how deleting uh, the, the words or deleting a specific context from uh, an archive material that sort of um, gained universality in a way, uh, or space for imagination. It was quite interesting. Um. There was, this was an interesting, Chen Ren's work was an interesting insertion um, in, into the show from, uh, from Singapore. Mm. Um, it would have been too difficult to stage this work here. There are four, uh, 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 four uh, projections uh, and a, a series of documentary images. Uh, it's also a very uh, long extended video. I think um, one of the qualities of Singapore Art Museum spaces was that it, they were able to really lend themselves to that uh, kind of installation and this one by Tosa Park. Um, this, uh, in this work, um, the space is actually dark. Uh, there are a number of travel photographs that he took in, in Malaysia. Um, but uh, the only way for uh, the audience to see the work is to take a photo uh, with a flash camera and then look at the images once they've left the room. Um, Singapore has, uh, Singapore Art Museum is in a beautiful old schoolhouse. Uh, which means that it has a number of um, quite small, quite intimate rooms, uh, which lended an interesting um, inflection, I think, on the exhibition because it um, produced 
uh, perhaps a degree of intimacy um, uh, in the fact that uh, for the viewer you're encountering a work that's either alone or simply in conversation with one other work um, rather than uh, the kinds of more open, uh, dare we say, flowing installations that uh, you would have seen in Tokyo, Osaka or even upstairs here. Mm. Um, uh, an another interesting one, which we didn't include because this has been shown in APT7, um, is this work by um, Pratay Pinto, um, who's a, a, an artist who had uh, found out um, about groups of Thai workers who were traveling to Lapland uh, for the uh, berry picking season. Um, and uh, very much interested, I guess, in regimes of labor and exchange. Um, had uh, uh, traveled up there and joined these, these workers um, in, uh, uh, to open up, I guess, another avenue for exploring exchange. A part of this project involved, while he was picking um, berries, uh, sending the daily weight to a curator um, at an exhibition space um, in France, um, uh, who was then um, uh, committed to filling the room, the exhibition space, um, with a number of objects um, coming to that weight. Um, the work was shown here in APT7 back in 2012, um, where we made up that, I think it was 508 kilograms? 549. 449. With um, recycled paper, uh, or paper to be recycled, uh, so that the stuff our daily waste from under the desks was, desks was accumulated. Um, but uh, a really lovely solution was, uh, was, was arrived at, um, I think, in, in both of your museums. Mm. Um, Kelfa, did you want to talk about the way you address this project? Yeah, yeah um, well, it has to be something unused or, or waste um, that curators, well, have to sort of uh, accumulate. Um, and I was looking at various, uh, various uh, waste or objects uh, within the museum. And there was this huge uh, piano. Yeah. Um, Steinway. <laughs> yes. Uh, very old uh, Steinway was sitting in the basement of the museum. And no one really knew how it came, how it ended up in the you know, basement unused for years. Um, but I thought it's kind of interesting to you know, have it in the <laughs> exhibition space as a waste. Yeah. Um, so I asked, uh, uh, I asked people how much it weighs and, and no one really knew. Um, but I thought I would start with this. And so we... Um, <laughs> we four actually, go downstairs. <laughs> yeah, we actually moved uh, to downstairs and moved the piano up. And then um, I was contemplating what, what else to add or uh, how to weight this huge thing. Um, but then when I did the first gallery talk, um, after the talk, there was a man coming up to me and say, said, um, uh, the, you can, this is a Steinway uh, Type D. Oh, wow. He was a, tuner, a piano tuner. Wow. And he knew exactly what type it is. <laughs> so I've, yeah, I've managed to find out it's, it's about um, nine, 490 kilo. Oh, okay. So um, we didn't quite make it. No. <laughs> no, no. But then there was another interesting thing. Uh, there was a woman regularly coming into an exhibition space, and she played the piano there. Right. And I, I got a phone call from the gallery guide. Like he, she was almost panicking. Oh, there's a woman playing the piano, um, and it's been an hour. So <laughs> what should I do? <laughs> but then I thought, okay, I'm gonna let her play unless she's like playing like frantically. Um, so. <laughs> And, and she came like uh, 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 once a week, so I <laughs> thought so it would be too cruel to add something, something else to, so that she can play. So, but if and then I thought, it'd be, you know, she will wear around. It's exactly, yeah. Yeah. So we we probably made it. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I think um, so. And then uh, as a, <laughs> um, there, there's another element, I guess you'll see here um, that he basically stole a watch <laughs> a watchtower from. Uh, the part of the forest that the, the, uh, the workers were uh, picking the berries in because nobody ended up getting paid. Mm. Um, and this deconstructed watchtower is actually the only element of the work that travels between venues, apart from uh, some still images in the video that, um, that are projected there. Um, the curators have a choice, uh, it's interesting, as to whether or not they actually construct the tower. So it was deconstructed here in Tokyo. Um, 
and constructed uh, in Osaka yes. and accompanied by... Yeah, <laughs> well, but for me it was kind of difficult order that I have to find some unused thing in a museum because um, Pratchett already did this project in Paris, Italy, Brisbane, uh, China and yeah. Tokyo. And, you know, some kind of safe unused thing like paper doesn't harm anything mm. is already, you know, up mm. as a exhibition, uh, as a part of this work. So I, um, I communicated with Prachaya that uh, um, I really want to use something sleeping in our storage. <laughs> so I tried to um, do an exhibition in exhibition, this small um, four sculpture, using those four sculptures. Uh, actually, two of those uh, frequently appears in the you know, collection, but the one of them, the um, uh, bird with a small ball, we didn't see that piece for maybe more than 25 years. Mm. So kind of unused thing mm. in the museum. And um, yeah, so the, I, yeah, this is kind of small exhibition in Prachaya's work and the title was, I don't remember. Uh, the title of this project's work is Give More Than You Take. So I uh, titled this small exhibition, Give You More Than I Take. And uh, you see that the bars there, two bars, one is flying and one is sitting on the ground. So maybe you can imagine that the bird is like a Thai worker who fly to Lapland, and, but uh, sometimes they are kind of exploited by the employee. So you can see the birds with um, some kind of, you know, fruits or berry, but uh, he, the, the bird doesn't <laughs> pick. And the uh, uh, right black one is a very nice sculpture by Jean Alp. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the title is Fruit. So that really fits the context. And hmm. this big uh, black concrete sculpture is by Michael Heiser, who is really famous for his land art, land art project. And the title of this work is Offering. Mm. So I re really want to abstract the structure of Fratcher's artwork using some artworks from our collection. Mm and I try to build up the tower so maybe people can watch uh, those birds <laughs> from that watchtower. Mm. Yeah. Did anyone go up? No, mm. it's too dangerous. <laughs> yeah, there are actually some parts missing, no? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in Singapore, the work was, uh, was filled in by uh, so a number of newspapers. Yeah. From street vendors. From, yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, it was interesting too, uh, in that this there was an interesting um, acquisition of works. This work was uh, sitting in the space next to uh, Jonathan Jones' beautiful um, illumination fall mm. wave, um, which opens the exhibition. Um, I don't think it opened it the, the exhibition at all of our venues. Mm. It was the mm. first work uh, that people came across, but a work. Um, that's very much about the potential of encounter and uh, exchange and, and uh, the, uh, the ghost, really, of exploitation. Mm. Um, so it was an interesting accompaniment of those two works. Yeah. Um, we've spoken for about 45 minutes. So I wondered if um, anybody in the audience had any questions um, for our guests here today um, about the exhibition, about any um, aspects of its construction, um, the ideas that went into it, or uh, any of the particular works. Got one down the front here. Um, if we're bringing you a microphone, if you could speak into the microphone, because we are recording this. Thanks, Jasmine. Thank you. It's a wonderful exhibition. Thank and you. one aspect of the exhibition that I have really enjoyed 
is the fact that there are different languages inherently presented in several of the works. So I wanted to ask you about the role of language in the collaboration between the four curators and how your experience of language, the language that you have communicated between each other with, has informed your selection of works. Because obviously there are two works, the work by Mamora and the work by Jose Nen, where quite explicitly and very poetically we are aware of the function of several languages intersecting at the same time. Azusa, maybe if you had some thoughts, because this comes into the discommunication uh, that you were talking about earlier with Tsubasa work as well. Right. Um, well, basically, we, we just, it, between curators, we discussed in like English, mm. email communication, a Skype communication. And uh, yeah, language issue was kind of um, tricky in some point. So um, that's why I couldn't show Ringo Bruno's Bruno yes. artwork, mm. the ending and no ending, because it is written in English. And for like Japanese audience, it's kind of hard to reach the each context. It's just like a for them, maybe it's just like a picture. Even for me, it we take much time to read each English text. So that kind of things maybe affected us to select mm. each like set of artworks. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I mean, uh, I think language really sort of as an issue or as an as a platform. Uh, it's it's something that we are maneuvering uh, at it at low lo lot of other you know different levels, like like she sh like she said we are always communicating in English, which is uh, my uh, uh, second well our second language your third language whatever, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which is you know quite tough for us um, um, when it comes to really sort of trying to communicate. Um, nuances or, or mm. of uh, certain artwork or nuances of our feelings. Um, so I, but I really appreciate that other uh, colleagues are really patient um, and uh, open. And, but then um, I think, so that experience actually sort of translated into uh, an expression in a very, uh, delicate way, for example. For example, uh, the work of uh, Vandi Ratana. Mm. I knew that no one would understand his language, mm. uh, Khmer, but I wanted to, uh, I wanted the audience to hear it. And um, because there are a lot of um, uh, emotional, you know, flow, mm. which uh, we can still capture from listening to his tones and um, or mm, yeah, I mean, Hozunian's work, uh, many, I knew that many of the audience wouldn't understand either of mm -hmm. the language. Um, but then um, there's, you know, layers of, of different languages coming into one context. Uh, that historical moment actually existed and this, this figure lived this you know, layers of different um, uh, languages and also um, political um, layers of the political uh, context and how he sort of, that actually informs how he sort of uh, created his subject as a spy or uh, as a subject, mm. which is contested mm -hmm. in, in many different ways. Um, which I think is an interesting example how we can, it's, it's an opposite example of how we have to consolidate our, nas uh, our national or gender identity now. Um, so yeah, I mean, language plays in different um, ways in the expression and in our collaboration. Mm. Any other questions? Yes, this one up the back there.
First of all, thank you very much for the very interesting conversation. So I, I felt that the last artwork was very interesting because if I understood it correctly, basically the, the artist uh, sets the concept, then the actual construction of the work, uh, or installation, I should say, uh, was actually up to each curator. Are you talking about Parchaya's work? Yes. The, the last okay. one, yes, the yeah. piano, with piano and... Yeah. Um, well, according to my very naive understanding of how artists and curators work together, I was thinking artists would create the work then which, which would be delivered to you guys as a sort of completed thing, then your job is to set the context and, and find the best interpretation of the work so that the work would be best shown. Yeah. However, in that particular piece, curators were part of the um, creation part. Yeah. Mm. So I have two questions. Uh, if, um, I'm just curious to know if uh, that kind of experience is uh, unique or maybe in contemporary art, it's, it's actually kind of a more usual thing for curators. So that's the first question. And if it's a unique thing, that's my assumption here, I'm just um, curious to know how you communicated mm. with the artist to make sure uh, his or her work uh, mm. was um, you know, realized in the way the artist actually conceptualized yeah. the, the, the work. Can yeah. I? Mm. Please? Yes. Well, I think the, as much as uh, Prachaya was, was uh, focusing on the, you know, how the labor was placed within this you know, uh, cheap labor, global, cheap global market, he was conscious of this relationship between the curator and the artist, or the, how artist is circulated um, within the international art scene. Um, so, I think he wanted us, the curators, to experience what it is to be like an artist, to, be, to have to work for a curator. So for me, uh, my experience was, as well, it was interesting, but then also very, I got a lot of pressure <laughs> to, be, to have to sort of complete the artwork. Um, I hated experience, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so he's very clever in that way. Like he's, he's many, uh, he, he layered different, you know, uh, contexts in the work. Um, and I think it's certainly unique. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I, I really understand and agree with Kyung for some, but uh, at the same time, um, curator has to do some really crucial decision in the exhibition layout. Mm. So maybe you can see the difference between each venues and, um, for example, Kim Bomb's The Art of Transforming, um, me and uh, Kim Bomb was talking how I can show effectively the book piece because that is only just a small book. So that um, if audience can, uh, if audience wants to, uh, audience can't read the detail. So I um, decided to pick up one uh, chapter and put on like wall text. So that kind of every single decision is really touches the, how say, artist's, you know, core. Mm. So yeah, I, of course, I, I'm not an artist and I don't want to do that kind of cre creation, but um, I have to be responsible for, you know, that kind of layout and then decision and that would be like a curatorial matters. Yeah. Mm. In terms of the communication between I and, and Prachaya, um, I ended up asking many questions, mm -hmm. and he didn't answer any of it. <laughs> like he was like, <laughs> really? Was like, yeah. I mean, he's yeah. like, do what you want. It's so he really left left me alone, uh, and and sort of, I think as a way of you know, that's 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 the that's the artist who's feeling. Mm -hmm. Like you know, who's feeling like you know, uh, working for an curator. So I, I feel like it's certain a kind of a revenge. It, it's, <laughs> it's true, and it's 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 really interesting. It's a very clever conceit of his, and I think um, it uh, uh, just as in his way of um, stealing that uh, that watchtower, he was uh, kind of um, tipping the tables a little bit to what small degree he could uh, within the framework of this very unfair labor relationship. Um, 
He's turning the tables on curators by forcing on them uh, responsibility for the, um, uh, this major aesthetic decision um, mm. about the work. But uh, as you say, in, uh, I could say anecdotally, like each time um, I've, I've been in the same place as Prachaya where one of these uh, works has been shown, I've like said, hey, what do you think? What do you think? And he could be like, oh, yeah. And that's it. <laughs> uh, so he performs that role in a, a, a very, very well and very rigorously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But he also said that the moment of stealing the watchtower yeah. with other uh, Thai workers was a really important moment mm -hmm. for them to experience the solidarity and also, um, you know, sort of like you know, revenge in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so he said uh, he's, he organized that uh, at four in the morning, like waking everyone, everyone up and I went there and you know, just smashed the, the watchtower and bring it back. So it, for them, I mean, this watchtower is a really important element mm -hmm. um, and for him also, yeah. Have we got, we got time for one more question, if there's anybody. Okay, I might leave it there because we're about to run into lunchtime. Um, first of all, could you um, join me in thanking Kyungfa and Azusa for being so generous? Um, I'd also like to let you know that um, you'll be hearing from the, or you can hear from um, the artists speaking about their work um, from 1 p.m. up in the exhibition space. So it's up on level three. Uh, at the top of the elevators there, you'll see the signage for the exhibition if you haven't been there yet. Uh, Bruce Quek, Miyagi Futoshi and Jonathan Jones will all be providing insights um, into the work that they have on display. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.